Hey, this is Phil Simon from the Huffington Post, and I'm pleased today to be joined once again by the Commander-in-Chief and Keyboardist of Marillion, Mr. Mark Kelly. <laughs> you read my Facebook profile. Uh, I, did. I didn't even remember the, <laughs> doing that, but it, it always makes me laugh whenever I see it, so I'm, I haven't bothered to change it. Being Commander-in-Chief of Marillion, yeah. without the rest of the band knowing about it, is quite a good thing. <laughs> right. Well, I, I meant to ask you uh, during previous interviews if um, other members um, came with military titles. So was there a sergeant or a lieutenant or something and how that worked? Not at all. I think it was just, you know, when you do that thing where it's Facebook asks you where you worked and then I put that I worked at Marillion, as it's, you can't say with Marillion or in Marillion, mm -hmm. at Marillion. And then it, it gave me some options on job titles, I think, and I thought, oh, commander in chief. <laughs> so that's, I think that's how it happened. It's, it was a while ago, though. Oh, good stuff. Well, first, uh, let's talk about the new album, Fear. Uh, congratulations. I, I really do think it's an epic. And I noticed that um, it's placing pretty high in the charts in many countries. Is that shocking? Um, I suppose it's a surprise. I wouldn't say shocking. I mean, the thing is, you've got to, you've got to um, put that against the background of, you know, sales being as low as they've ever been. So mm -hmm. whilst a top 10 chart position, the last time we were in the top 10, should we say, um, in fact, the last time we had a chart position as good as this across most European countries was in 1987 with clutching at straws oh, wow. but then but then a num that was i think the album got to number two but it was a hundred thousand sales in the uk alone so um completely different story now but having said that we're still competing against other artists for the sharp positions regardless of what the sales are um so when we're up there with bruce springsteen and passenger and a few other people that i recognize the names of it's quite a lot of stuff in the charts i don't recognize these days right. um, it's still it's it's still a nice thing and it's, it, it was a pleasant surprise um but what's more important i think is the reviews that we've had and um, we've had some really great reviews i haven't seen a single bad review and every review I've seen. Maybe that's just because we get sent the good ones. But um, right. no, seriously, every review has been, been fantastic. So um, it's great to, 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 for people to get it um, after spending three years working on something. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when you, not when you wonder if it's any good, but you wonder if people are going to feel the same way as you do about it, you know? Yeah. Well, let's talk about the album. Was there an intent with Fear to do something especially bold or did it just sort of turn out that way? There was an intent. I think we had a conversation fairly early on, which was instigated by Mike Hunter, our producer. And it was something along the lines of, well, we've taken, you know, from 2009 to 2012 to make um, sounds that can't be made, because before that, Happiness is the Road came out in 2009. And then we're, we're a couple of years into making this album. And he just said, Think about it, guys. You probably don't, you haven't got many albums left in you. You know, we're, we're not getting any younger, and I'm I'm the youngest in the band, and I'm 55. So, you know, and he was right, and we, and he said, and I'm not. I mean, he's younger than us, but he said I'm not, you know, getting any younger. And he said, and I'm too old to be making average music. He said I want it to be great, and we all said so do we. And so we said, well, let's just let's not accept anything that isn't as good as it can be, and that's the attitude that we had, and I think. With the first test that we had was about, you know, uh, just as we were getting to the sort of the end of the writing process, and we had a couple of songs. Um, one of them was called "Things Buried," and another one was was called oh, "The Name Escapes Me." But anyway, there were there were two songs that had good lyrics, um, but the music wasn't believable. Hmm. It wasn't quite, you know, it was good, but it wasn't. We didn't all get really excited, you know, and, and in, in the past when we've had that, it's sort of, we've just sort of gone with it because there's always somebody who's going, oh, I think this is a really good song. So at this point, we made a decision to not consign them to the bin, but to say, okay, those two songs aren't good enough. Hmm. So you've, raised, Eight, you've effectively raised the bar. Exactly. And, hmm. and, you know, and I think there's always been, for me, there's always been at least one song on every album we've made that I haven't thought was good enough or I, I didn't like you know and this album is the I think it's the first album we've ever made that I just think yeah I really think all five t t titles although there's 17 tracks it's actually five songs um it's, you know subdivided down a little bit but um you know all five songs 
I'm really proud of and I'm really happy that they're all on the album, which which is a nice nice feeling, you know. So, um, you know, understandably, H was reluctant to let these two songs go because because of the lyrics, you know, he's written these lyrics and they're, they're good lyrics. Um, and there's always that danger that once a song gets, once a lyric gets married up with some music that's not quite up there, um, and then we'll never revisit it. And we just said, no, we'll we'll scrap the music and start again, you know. And at some point in the future, those songs will probably emerge with completely different music. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, as you mentioned, there are they're, they're subdivided, but there really are the five tracks, um, most of which are quite long. Was that intentional, or did the music just kind of go organically in that direction? That it it made sense to have longer pieces. The music grew around the lyrics so you know you've got a song like levers or i think we probably even had more lyrics than than we used in the end but certainly the length of the songs are generally dictated by the length of the lyrics i mean we you know it's sometimes the lyrics aren't aren't finished but in, certainly the, there was enough material there and the subject matter is such that you can't really start chopping big chunks out you know something like the new kings or el dorado they were long lyrics, and and you've got to have the you know the music to to match. So really, that's that's what dictated the length. We certainly didn't set off set out with the idea of recording, you know, three epic songs. There's usually one long song, or maybe two long songs on an album, but to have three songs, one of them nearly twenty minutes, and two of them over fifteen minutes each, is is unusual even by our standards. So, um, and I'm sure people won't be complaining about that. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't something that we planned. Mm-hmm. Would you consider Fear a concept album? It seems like artists have a very complicated uh, relationship with that concept. Um, I think it's a concept album in the sense that it, it was written at a certain time, um, and so the subject matter, I think it's stretching it to call it a concept album because a song like White Paper doesn't really... Um, it's not really about the same thing as the rest of them. It's a personal mm-hmm. lyric written from somebody who's at a certain point in their life. It's it's semi autobiographical, I think, from Steve H. Uh, but he does that, you know. He'll he'll mix up his own life, his own feelings, his own thoughts with fictional stuff, and um, you know. Um, so it's always sometimes you know, we 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 do discuss you know what the lyrics are about and and you know i said to him you know i, I don't know how you you know how you do that you know you're sort of laying your soul bare for the world to see your your innermost feelings and and he said well it's not all re- it's not all me it's not all mm. real he said some of it is but then, but i'm not saying which is and which isn't you know so um that's but I suppose that's how he gets away with it in, in his own mind because it must be hard to do that. I, I, I would find it really difficult. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think but, because of it, I mean, if, if Montreal last April was an example, that's the reason, the, one of the reasons anyway, that the crowd responds in such an emotional way. It's not mailed in. It's very authentic. I think people respond to that exactly. And, and of course, people relate to a, a lot of the things he sings about and writes about. So... And if it's real and it's genuine, authentic, people can tell, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and and the music complements the words. We we spend a lot of time trying to get the right music to go with the, you know, the words, um, which is generally involves the band jamming, <laughs> and H looking at what he's got and thinking, what does this piece of music sound like? Um, maybe this, and and so we'll end up with, you know, with this album we had hundreds, literally hundreds of musical ideas um, you know, in probably north of 300 musical ideas uh, that were all good, you know, worth worth a second look. And quite a few of them were were with the same lyric. And it was just a case of saying, okay, well, mm. just, you know, so we had a whole bunch of white paper bits. We had a whole bunch of, you know, El Dorado bits. And, and they, you know, the, the approaches were quite different in some cases. Uh, but we ended up with choosing what we thought was the really the best of what we had and, and the stuff that really was, you know, emotionally charged and and, you know, it's it's a it's quite a dark album, but it's also I think it's it it's it gives it gives me goosebumps listening to it. Even you know, I listened to it for the first time um after a break of a few months when we finished it, not so long ago because we were about to start rehearsing. And I was like, you know, getting that sort of hairs on my arm standing up thing or, you know, shivers down the spine. So I'm thinking, well, that's, 
you know, at my age, I don't get that very often with music. So, and if it's our music, I was thinking that's even even nicer, you know, because it's hard to be to look at your own music objectively. It's hard to hear it with fresh ears. So, leaving it alone for two or three months was was a way of doing that. Yeah, I know other artists have said the same thing. I think uh, five or six years ago, I was watching an interview with David Gilmour, who said that he would love to hear Dark Side for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can totally understand that. I'd love to hear Dark Side for the first time. <laughs> it's one of those albums that you. I can't listen to it with, with with fresh ears. You have to. I don't know. Sometimes you can listen to an album that you know really well and force yourself into a frame of mind where you tr- you know, you're trying to pretend you're hearing it for the first time and really listen for new things. Mm-hmm. And um, but yeah, it's funnily enough, I was listening to some of Dark Side of the Moon for the first time in years the, the other day. Um, and it's hard. It's hard because I grew up listening to that. Yeah. And so, yeah, but it, it's even harder when it's your own music. I can, I, I can sure. totally relate to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, the keyboard seemed a bit more pronounced on this album compared to Sounds That Can't Be Made. I was wondering if A, you agreed, and B, if you do, was that by design or did the music and finding the right match between lyrics and notes and chords uh, kind of dictate that? Um, with this album, it tended to be... Um, I came up with more musical ideas that were used. It's not, I'm not saying I came up with more musical ideas than anybody else, but certainly just because there's no, it's not like we have a, a quota, you know, oh, we're going to use this many of Mark's ideas and this many of Steve's ideas. Um, it's just what, whatever works best. And so as, the, the, the process of writing, it tended to be the initial ideas were mine, the sort of the bedrock, if you like, the, the chord progressions, and quite a lot of those keyboard sounds. The music was some great guitar parts on top, which, you know, it's always really, really nice to, you come with something you think is good and then, then the rest of the band make it great. You know, that's, that's a really nice um, environment to be in, you know, when you're working. Um, and, um, you know, I love the guitar solo in El Dorado. You know, I've got that big, the big keyboard part that you hear at the beginning beginning and then in the guitar solo it's the same keyboard part and and Steve soloing over it and it's just brilliant I love it so it's it's you know I think we've just we found a really a really great way of working that just um that just ended up with I think was you know a really really fruitful period of writing and and recording Mm -hmm. were there any songs that came together more quickly or easily or or which ones came together first um difficult to say i mean we were working on all of them at you know up to a point um the living in fear was quite early on um although it was called melt our guns originally and mm. then um and that one went through quite a, a lot of changes and we had we had a lot of stuff for that song and it, it had it was going loud quiet loud quiet loud quiet and there was all these d- different bits and, and they were all really good and then at some point i was one of the people in the band that said we need, to, we need to make it shorter. We need to chop some of this out. It's just too much. Mm. All, all the bits are great, but together they don't make a great song. It just somehow didn't hang together. So we did some drastic editing to it. And it's still quite long, but, um, but I think it's better for it. But that was a bit of a, that was more difficult in some ways than, than some of the others. We, the, the, the three whoppers, the three big ones, uh, New Kings, I think was probably first to come together, and then El Dorado. And Levers was one that, that sort of was lots of bits because we had all, it, it, and I think probably more than any of the others, it has a sort of, you know, you can, you can tell there are different things at different times. I don't know. Um, but the, the White Paper song was, was a very late addition. We only had four, the four songs until we got to Real World. And, and we had a list of things we wanted to do there. And Mike, our producer, said, well, look, we've, you know, if we get this lot done, I'd like to look at this song, White Paper. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things, ideas for it here. Um, can we look at it? I think He said, I think it will bring something to the album that's not there at the moment. And I think he, what he probably meant by that was the, you know, the personal lyric rather than it being a lyric about the world. It was, it was an internal, you know, the, the other songs, if it can be said, it, they're a concept. Certainly, Melt Our Guns, um, sorry, Living in Fear, <laughs> calling it Melt Our Guns now, Living in Fear, New Kings, and El Dorado are all from the same family, if you like. They're, if you had a concept album, they could be part of it. 
believers is not really part of that. I think it's because it's more about, you know, life, the life of a touring musician. Or in fact, as, as Steve Hogarth was saying, it's not really about him. He was thinking more of the, the crew because, mm-hmm. you know, when you're in a band, you only tour, certainly in our case, a few months of the year. But if you're, if you're working as a crew member, if you're not touring, you're not earning money. You know, it really is. That's your life. And, and that's the whole the, the line about, you know, being at home, waiting for the phone to ring, you know, waiting for the call. Right. Because and, and being alive and being, you know, being being a useful member of society, for want of a better word, you know, earning a living whilst, you know, whilst you're on the road. And if you're not on the road, then none of those things are happening. So but um, but white paper. Yeah, we we were at um, real world. We had a bit of time left at the end of the last few days. And um, we, it, it all just came together in the studio you know we had a few few musical ideas that we then grew into the song yeah it sounded like based on the interviews i'd um, heard or read that maybe what sounds that can't be made it was put together in different parts and maybe at the end kind of rushed out i think i was reading an interview with steve rothery about that whereas with this one was the process a bit more deliberate we had more time certainly and we didn't put ourselves in a position like we had with sounds that can't be made where we were on tour and the album wasn't finished and we were doing recording on the road and listening to mixes on the road and we didn't have time what we because of the way we work i I just work on my own at home and then mike will be recording the vocals or some guitars and it's quite often that we don't we don't hear what each other have done until fairly late on in the process and sometimes you'll have this thing where one person, mainly between Steve Rothery and I, where, where you know he'll do one thing over a piece of music and I'll do something else, <laughs> and the two things don't really go together, or they don't, you know, you can't have both of them, and then there'll be a big fight where we go, oh yeah, but I thought that was going to be my bit, and they go, well, I thought it was a solo, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you get nice accidents from that because you, you know working, not knowing what each other are doing, but a lot of the times it can lead to um, problems, and so those problems need to be fixed. And, and usually you need time. And also the other thing, of course, is if somebody makes a major change to a section of a song or adds something that nobody's heard, people need time to live with it and decide whether or not they like it. Because I mean, the, the, the instant reaction is always, oh, what's that? It's you. I don't like that. You know, I liked it as it was. You know? <laughs> so to, to give things a fair chance, you need to live with it for a bit. And we didn't have that on sounds that can't be made. I'm not saying it turned out badly because of that, but we felt like it was a it was a strain and a bit of a struggle towards the end mm. uh, this one we we had a finish date and then we watched it sail by and then we had another finish date and we watched that sail by. so there was a sense that it had to be completely right before we let it go um of course we still ended up with the problem of, of um missing our deadline for artwork to be ready for the ultimate edition and they st- they've only just been being shipped now um so you know, there's we had to mm. we manufactured a whole bunch of just just CDs and slipcases and sent them to everybody that ordered the ultimate edition as a sort of here, this is the album to be going on with while we get the, mm. the thing you ordered to you because it was just going to be a few weeks later than it should have been, and, and these people spent quite a lot of money to buy this, you know, and, and we felt that the least we could do was at least get a CD to them. Yeah. So it's just, that was a real shame, but yeah, and we thought you working with with pledge music that we wouldn't have any of these problems it wasn't really their fault it was more to do with the artwork being late which was ultimately our fault i suppose yeah so well from everything that i've heard about the artwork and by extension the visual experience on the tour um, it sounds like you're willing to take it up a notch from previous tours i guess uh, the impetus being uh, i know back in montreal when i saw invisible man i was blown away by the not just the audio but the visual and it, the way it really integrated together it was is that kind of the um uh, the goal this time to replicate that yeah, for as many of the it, newer songs it, as possible yeah we, if we can get um you know video screens rather than projection it just it, it really is impressive to have you know because the good thing about this is they're so bright and then when they're off it's just black there's no screen you know so it's a it's a great thing on stage to have that and we've and we've been producing movies for we've got movies for all the all the new songs and we've been making movies for some of the old ones like this strange engine and and you know we've already had like invisible man there was ocean cloud and there's you know as we've been going on um we decided it would be good to have some some visual stuff for 
you know, not every song, but but you know, the ones that 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 would benefit from it. You know, we did a video for King, and it's a bit too good because the the audience is like, <laughs> it's got all these. I would say it's too good. Is it, it because it, it it invites the audience to participate? That's the problem because it's all these shots of of um, you know famous famous dead people. Elvis basically. Presley like, and Jimi Hendrix yeah. and yeah. So, and then when Lemmy comes on, there's a big cheer goes up, and John Belushi, and you know, uh, and um, yeah, we're probably breaching a bunch of copyrights, but there you go. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, we won't get. We won't get um, no, but that was. I mean, it, it, it. You're right. If anything, it might have distracted from watching the band. But yeah, I mean, Stephen Wilson has done that at his concerts for years, um, in, in discouraging people from taking crappy YouTube videos and just putting down your devices and just living in the experience. And it's. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the things we at the last I can't remember if we did it when we were in Montreal, but certainly in in um, in the Netherlands, I went on before we played and asked people not to hold their iPads or their phones up throughout the show because it's just so annoying for everybody behind them as well. You know, it really ruins the experience, really. Yeah, um, I know. You're... Did you see that? Sorry, I was going to say, did you see that picture of? Um, there's a photograph I just saw today of, of Obama and, and Hillary Clinton doing, a, I don't know what they were doing, some sort of press conference. They look like students, actually. But anyway, the picture was them two from the side and the audience. And the entire audience had their back to them with their phones like this. So they were, they were doing huh. a, a selfie with, the, with, the, you know, with Obama and Clinton behind them so they could go, oh, here's me. With, with, you know. It's just a sign of modern life, I suppose. You know? <laughs> oh, I'll, have to, I'll have to check that out. That reminds me a little bit of uh, at the end of your shows when you take the pictures with everyone in the, in the crowd in the background. Right. But it was just bizarre to see all these people facing the wrong way. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely a sign of the times. Um, you're going to be heading to the States in not too long for the first time in, I think, four and a half years? It was 2012, I think, the summer of 2012. We were here last time, or there. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. I, we, we enjoy touring the States. It's a different experience um, to touring Europe, and we've toured Europe a lot more, obviously. But there's still a, yeah, there's an excitement. It's like it's, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a novelty as well. And, you know, the different, different venues, um, it's, we're doing some nice theatres this time as well, I think, which, which should be interesting. Um, you know, I think maybe it's something to do with the, the age of our audience as well, that people like to be able to sit down sometimes, or at least, at least be in a venue where your feet don't stick to the floor, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, you, you, if you're going to be taking your wife out for a night out, you, you know, it, it's not something that you want to be in a smelly club somewhere, you know? Right. So... I, there's always, you know, smelly clubs sometimes have a nice atmosphere. <laughs> anyway. No, but if the club isn't that big, you can sit down maybe in the back and still have an enjoyable time. I know in, in Montreal, I think it was the Olympia Theater, uh, I, my back isn't so good, so I sat down the whole time. And there were moments when you'd stand with a particularly poignant moment, but you'd still enjoy the concert without having to hurt your back the whole time. So I, I think the sure. side, you got, I think you're selecting the right kinds of venues. Yeah. And yeah. I think it, it it certainly worked when we when we played the Olympia in um, in Paris. It's a, a lovely old theatre, and you know you, I'm sure we sold more tickets because people went, oh, they're playing the Olympia. We're going to see them there. Mm. You know, it's just it's. I think it's just so we have to accept that we're not all teenagers, and not not everybody wants to be crammed down the front. You know, um, yeah. Well, especially when you have a more visual experience, can you really appreciate it if you're crammed up front versus, you know, taking a step back and, and hearing it and seeing it and really appreciating the enormity of it. Exactly. You get a better, better visual experience and the sound is usually better a bit further back. It's not, it's yeah. not so, you know, disjointed, but yeah. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Should, should, should be, um, should be a good tour. Yeah. Well, as am I. And uh, I see John Wesley's uh, opening for you guys in the States. Yeah, well, we just thought, what are we asking? We haven't we haven't toured with John for a long, long time, and um, he's still he's still making music, so why not? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it, Mark. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time. I look forward to seeing you on tour. Good, yeah, good to see you, and um, see you. Um, you said you were going to possibly come to LA, San Francisco. Um, yeah, try try and keep me away. I already got my tickets. Oh, cool. Okay. Right. We'll see you there. Cheers.